What do we have to do? Let's go. Let's go to space. So welcome everybody to Fridays with Tim. Today is February 11th, 2022. This is the first call we've had so far this year and very excited to see everybody here today. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen here and we will uh, we'll go through just the uh, a couple of slides I've got prepared uh, and then uh, we'll take questions. And we've had a pretty steady trajectory for uh, investment in this current round of the net capital raise which uh, we're, we're really appreciative of. As I was mentioning, this is the second round that we've done with Net Capital. We raised a million dollars earlier last year and this current round, uh, right now we just, we're just past the million dollar mark, which brings our total through the Net Capital platform at around uh, about $2.1 million to date. And uh, really appreciative of, 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 these early, of you, our early investors and your participation uh, in, in the, the beginning of orbital assembly and, and the future of humanity in space. So, so thanks so much for that. Uh, the second part I wanted to show everybody, which we've, we've got a graph showing launch costs. And I just want to remind people why what we're doing is possible. And uh, when you look at, when you look at the, the cost of launch to orbit over the last 50 years, since you know, the, the late 60s with, with Sputnik and uh, the Soyuz craft and the Saturn V, uh, the price per kilogram to orbit has been pretty consistent, averaging around $8,000 a kilogram. Now, there was a, a stark anomaly during the space shuttle program where the cost to orbit actually, if you look at the, the average cost for a launch with the space shuttle over the life of the program, was about $60,000 per kilogram. And if you think about you know, any company doing business and trying to have a profitable venture, if you were, let's say, making a widget in China and shipping it across the United States, and it costs you $60,000 per kilogram to get that material from point A to point B, there's, there's very few businesses that could have a successful business case with those kind of transportation costs. But we've seen two revolutions in launch costs. The first started with SpaceX and you know, early Falcon 1 leading into the Falcon 9 with the reusable first stage. And we're seeing that you know, other companies are, are picking up uh, that methodology of reusing the first stage. And we've seen launch costs with the Falcon 9 program drop below the $3,000 a kilogram uh, to LEO benchmark, and, and they're continuing to fall. And so that's, that's revolution number one. The second one, which I'm very excited about, and I'm sure like many of you, uh, I was watching you know, SpaceX's update last night on the Starship program. And Starship is revolutionary in that they're looking to have full reusability of not just the first stage, but also the second stage. The entire rocket uh, will be fully reusable. And Elon Musk last night threw out some numbers for launch costs. He was saying, you know, factoring in the, the fixed costs, conceivably the cost for a, a, a Starship launch could be the, at the $10 million mark. And he was saying, Starship's projected to have a capacity to LEO of 150 tons. So if you do the math, it comes out to about $67 a kilogram. So if you look at Space Shuttle era, $60,000 a kilogram. In the next few years, $67 a kilogram to, to orbit. These fundamental shifts in transportation are what is making companies like Orbital Assembly and many others a reality. Um, no longer do we have to be paying uh, prices that make commercial ventures a, a non-starter from the beginning, right? So, so that's something that's really important and key. And I just wanted to, to throw that out there again uh, for, for people who you know, might not be following things as closely as we have been. That's the fundamental shift that's making everything possible. Okay, so with that, um, we'll get to questions and answers. There's a couple of questions that actually showed up on the Net Capital discussion page, which I'm going to be getting to today as well as uh, your questions in chat. And so, um, first of all, we say hello to Benny. Hi, Benny. Oh, and also, if you want to ask a question live, use the, uh, the tool in Zoom here to raise your hand, and uh, we'll try to bring you up. OK, so Marco, uh, he's asking, has OAC many, made any technological advancements since the D-STAR? So just to recap, D-STAR was the demonstration structural trust assembly robot 
which we showcased in Southern California last summer, where we built uh, a very large, uh, a very heavy steel truss in, in a matter of minutes. And uh, the, the question to that, uh, or the answer to that is yes. Uh, the Star was designed and uh, engineered in 2020. And then last year in 2021 was the, the fabrication and the, the validation and testing and demonstration. But all of last year, we've actually been working on, and, and, and coming into this year as well, working on the Pioneer Station uh, design and architecture. And, and right here behind me is one of the early versions of Pioneer. This is the version that we actually submitted for the NASA solicitation uh, for private space stations uh, last year. And um, since that time of that NASA solicitation, we've, we've made significant advancements on that uh, you know, going forward. And I did, and, and thanks Marco for that question, because I did want to touch a little bit on that NASA solicitation. And uh, NASA, initially when they announced the awards, they didn't publish the full analysis that they had sent to us. They asked us to, to, to not disseminate that. But a week or two ago, they made that fully public. And I'm guessing they wanted to wait until you know appeal periods had passed and they'd had a chance to talk with, with, with each of the applicants individually. And our team actually had the opportunity to speak with the selection panel in January about our proposal. And uh, there really was nothing shocking that came out of that meeting. We, we had already either come to the same conclusions as them previous to that meeting or you know, read it in their response. But it was a, a really good opportunity just to kind of get some face-to-face -face contact and, and uh, dig into maybe some of the nuance behind some of their responses. So I did want to go through just a couple of things on that, that NASA meeting before we get these other questions, really in response to some of the questions that have been coming out on the Net Capital discussion page. Um, so first of all, the, the evaluation process was based on some very strict and narrow requirements that NASA had. And there was four steps to their, their evaluation. The first was they just reviewed our executive summary to see if we complied with the overall uh, requirements of the announcement. And in step one, there were actually several companies whose submissions were just rejected outright because they didn't. Um, ours met those baseline requirements, and so we moved on to subsequent st stages. So step two was an initial review and selection of the most favorable proposals. Uh, step three was due diligence and an opportunity for finalists to revise proposals based on their weaknesses and the Space Act agreement negotiations occurred. And step four was final evaluation. So our project, we made it to step two, which is where our project proposal was disseminated to the selection panel, and they each weighed in on the different aspects of it. Because we weren't selected as one of the finalists, we didn't have that opportunity to revise and negotiate. Uh, and, and actually, the three finalists all were selected as eventual awardees. So the NASA ratings uh, ranked. Uh, the different criteria on the the um, the uh, their interpretation of if we met the objective from meets very few of the goals objectives to meets or exceeds all, and then a confidence rating of very low to very high, and so then those were assigned a, a red, yellow, white, green, blue color, and. Uh, both of those metrics are fairly subjective. I think I think that's important to understand. Um, and so going into it, there was a bunch of different categories. The, the, the main overarching categories were the technical approach and the business approach. So the technical approach uh, was a station behind us was what we submitted. And um, uh, some things that we ranked high on were we had more than two crew uh, possible on the station at initial operations. And then they really liked our modularity and that we had potential for growth and scalability. Um, some, of the, some of the negatives, which we've talked about before in calls, but uh, I'll, I'll go into these again. Um, one of the things which they put in there was a lack of understanding of the complexities for resupply and the artificial gravity concept and large crew proposed. So, so digging into that more, I think there was um, a concern for, for NASA that our original proposal here, in order for docking, uh, there was there was kind of a mixed interpretation there. 
They thought that we'd be docking with the state. Some people thought we were docking with the station in rotation, which we agree would be incredibly complex. And then some interpreted it as, well, you'd be starting and stopping, and that in itself would cause complexities, you know, stopping the rotation for docking. And, and so, um, so there, there was kind of a mixed bag on how they were interpreting what we were doing there. Um, also with the large crew proposed, there was concerns that uh, with existing launch providers, we wouldn't be able to get people to the proposed orbit that we were talking about, which is, which is uh, sun synchronous orbit. Now, as we just talked about at the beginning of this call, the whole launch paradigm has changed and shifted. Costs and capabilities of launch providers are not what they were several years ago. And NASA is still thinking in some of those older models. They haven't fully adopted the, the sea changes happened in launch uh, uh, providers. And so because of that, there was some concern there that we wouldn't be able to actually get people to these orbits. Um, based on our conversation with launch providers and what uh, you know, has been publicly released, we feel very confident that, that we can do that. Um, another one was, uh, they didn't feel that we addressed the space environment challenges uh, with maintaining a station and sun synchronous orbit. And, and that's true. We didn't go into much detail in our proposal. There was a very short number of pages and uh, we felt that that was something that uh, was a much deeper conversation. And so we gave a high level summary of it and they wanted more detail. And you know, that's just, just how, how it went. Um, the the, the in space environment in SSO is fairly well understood and, and we can engineer for that. Um, and then the last point they had, had there was lack of launch facilities available to launch crew into sun synchronous polar orbit. Again, that I, I think is looking at older uh, paradigms, uh, SpaceX and Falcon 9 and upcoming launch providers can, can do the dog leg and get, get crew and equipment to SSO. That's, that's, not, that's not an issue moving forward. Um, some of the other weaknesses, uh, oh, well, actually one of the strengths, they, they liked our flight demonstration of automated on-orbit assembly. They, they liked that uh, we'd be having, you know, the gravity ring and P-star going up early and, and demonstrating those things. Um, but then some, some negatives were, were a relatively new company and we haven't demonstrated something previously, right? Um, also, they said uh, a weakness was an undefined avionics and command and data handling design and risk assessment. assessment. Again, just for lack of space, we didn't go into that in, in details. Um, avionics and the CNDH aren't insurmountable problems. It's really, it's really a programming issue, algorithms, not a, a technical barrier. Um, and so, oh, you know, overall, um, oh, they did like our strong emergency response and redundancy planning. They, they gave us, uh, they marked that as a strength. And that's something that Overall Assembly Corporation has been really focused on since the get-go is making sure that if we're having tourists on the station, that it's going to be as safe as possible. So uh, they really like that. Um, and then one of the weaknesses, they the last weakness on the technical side was um, they saw a weakness for the complex assembly proposed, which increased significant risk for success. And that's actually something that we recognize as well early on in our design proposals. And you know, looking back, talking back to Marco's uh, point there, since even just last summer, we've made significant progress on launch complexity and assembly processes. Uh, we've eliminated a lot of steps and a lot of interfaces to, to make the assembly on orbit a lot more simple and reduce those failure, failure points. So um, you know, that's something that we've We've recognized that we're continuing to try to simplify and in increase uh, the likelihood of success. And, and really, it's it's not like we'd have a complete failure. There might be a hiccup where then we have to do some recovery, uh, you know, maneuvers. But um, having things work right out of the box is is you know goal number one, right? Um, and then on the on the the other side of it was the business summary, and uh, we ranked fairly low on that. And primarily, it's because we're, we're a new company. The, the metrics that were laid out in the solicitation favored large institutions that had um, funding from, from other sources. And you know, where we're at as a company, we just, we just don't have that. Um, also, since we've put that proposal together, um, in the last 12 months, as a team, we have really spent a tremendous amount of time dialing in our business strategy uh, 
fleshing out our customer base, uh, really sharpening and honing our pencils on pricing and meeting with vendors, uh, negotiating terms, uh, you know, getting that groundwork in place to have a, the most robust and solid business case and business plan as possible. And admittedly, you know, a year ago when we submitted this to, to NASA, we weren't as developed as we are now. So, uh, you know, I, I would like to think that if we were to submit again, we'd have a, a bigger, you know, maybe more, some more strengths in the mix. But again, how this proposal is written, it really favored, uh, you know, larger legacy companies. Um, so business strategy, that was one where uh, they didn't feel that we had um, enough customer information and, and we didn't actually include. So it was one of those things where they asked for certain things, but then what they really wanted was a little different. They wanted us to have like contracts, you know, and like, uh, you know, service orders in our solicitation. We didn't know that. We had a lot of LOIs, you know, letters of intent and people saying they were interested in using our product in the station, but we didn't have any like contracts. So we ranked low for that. Um, management team, the, the big weakness for the management team was, uh, they said, you know, management team has no experience in funding and developing a large scale human space system. To be fair, there's not many people who have done that. I would say even NASA hasn't done that. Uh, their, their funding has come through, <laughs> through the government. They didn't have to go out there and raise the funds. Uh, since a year ago, though, we have brought in some real experts on our, our uh, business side who have raised hundreds of millions of dollars for, for various ventures. And so, you know, that's a that's a place where uh, just internally we, we knew we needed to build that up and we have. Um, the financial plan, they said that we sought more funds from NASA than uh, the cost during the, the Space Act agreement. And we sought 75 percent of all available CLD funding. Um, so that so the first point was us projecting milestones down the road. And the second point, uh, we didn't know what the other companies were bidding. It turns out that the winners of the solicitation only asked for a tiny amount of funds up front. And then once they got on the selection committee uh, in the final list, they went back and renegotiated for much larger sums. So we didn't know that kind of political game going into this. Uh, we thought we were being fairly conservative. We we should have asked for like two million bucks and then gone back and negotiated for hundred. You know, <laughs> so that that was the the little game there that we didn't know uh, that the other the other companies were playing there. So you know, for example, Blue Origin they went in and asked for peanuts and then the eventual award they negotiated was for you know, the much larger sum. Um, and then the last two points: financial plan and our plan and schedule. Um, they they. They thought we had um, some weaknesses in our financing plan and our revenue plan. Um, I would agree with that. I think the, the plan that we submitted wasn't as strong and robust as we have now. Like I said, we put a lot of work into that over the last year. Um, so overall, that, that's kind of where we, we, we ranked and fell in, in the, um, you know, those different criteria. And just, just to remind everybody, NanoRax, uh, Northrop Grumman, and Blue Origin were the final awardees. Uh, space Villages, Orbital Assembly, Think Orbital, Maverick Space Systems, SpaceX, and Relativity Space, uh, we were all uh, proposals that advanced forward, but were ultimately not selected as finalists. And then Hammond Industries and uh, DEHAS, the Haas Limited, uh, they were eliminated in step one. They didn't, they didn't meet the requirements uh, outright. So you know, overall, we, we ranked on the technical side about as good as SpaceX, so I, I think that's a win. Uh, and then uh, we rank better than you know some of those other more well-known companies. So um, it, it was an interesting exercise. It, it helped us to advance our our way of communicating what we're doing uh, a lot, and also it helped us identify some of those uh, additional weaknesses. Um, just going through the exercise, you know, we identify weak spots in our business plan and, and some of the technical things. And so that's been you know a, a huge focus over the last year. So ho hopefully that, that provides some context for those who are who are asking. And I'm going to get into the questions now in chat. So if somebody else has a, a follow-up question they want to ask about that NASA solicitation response, I'm happy to do that. Um, let's see. So um, uh, thank you to those, again, in chat who've invested and uh, who are thinking of buying more shares. Really appreciate that. Um, the way the crowdfunding regulations, the CF round regulations work after you know, COVID, Congress increased the amount that companies can, sh 
can sell stock in these seed rounds from a million uh, and change to 5 million within the calendar year. So we've raised a little over 2 million. We can go another three uh, before we close out the round. But um, like I said, we're, we're, we're probably not going to get that another three in, in, in uh, 19 days. But uh, you know, every little bit helps, and it, and it helps us to extend the runway and to, to continue to develop and, and, uh, and progress the, the mission of the company. Uh, Matt Smith's asking, do you look at going further than Earth as a logical next step for your stations? Also, do you think testing long-term human habitation at various gravities is something that should or can be done in your stations? Uh, to both those questions, absolutely, yes. Um, orbital assembly is looking beyond LEO. Low Earth orbit is a good first step. It's something we can easily get to, something we understand very well, and there's a, a market here that exists. Uh, um, but the stations, you know, we're looking at, you know, the moon, Mars, cyclers, uh, and not just on orbit, but also, uh, you know, on, on surfaces of, of different planetary bodies. So, yeah, we're, we're definitely looking at creating space habitats that allow people to live, work, and thrive, ultimately, throughout the solar system. And as far as long-term human habitation at various gravity levels, that's something that um, is needed desperately. When uh, I, I was participating at a... Um, a workshop, uh, you know, towards the end of last year with with Jeff uh, Greeson, uh, or not Jeff Greeson, uh, Jeff Greenblatt on our team, and uh, Jeff Greeson's an advisor. Jeff Greenblatt's uh, one of our uh, vice presidents. Anyways, we were at we were at a, a NASA NIOC workshop uh, with uh, uh, a bunch of other industry people, and we were talking about you know large space settlements, and pretty much everybody in the room over those couple of days had said we need some long term studies done of people at various gravity levels. And so the very first station we put up there, you know, Pioneer Station is gonna allow for that critical uh, research to be done. Uh, probably starting some longer term studies with, with other mammals, but we're gonna have people on there as well. And so we'll be able to you know, scale up and, and do those studies and find out what is the gravity prescription? How much gravity do you need to overcome all these health effects that are coming from microgravity. Um, microgravity is brutal on human physiology from a cardiovascular, a skeletal, neurological. Um, it, there's there's so many so many effects, negative effects that come from staying long term in microgravity. So we know there's a certain amount of gravity we need. And yeah, we're, we're looking forward to helping to find those answers. Um, let's see. Um, so Alan's asking, will gravity ring, gravity is going to have to go to space before Starship is ready, correct? Um, yes. And in fact, Pioneer Station is going to be going to space before more than likely Starship is ready. So we've, um, we've designed our early missions to be platform agnostic. Now there's, you know, there's certain, uh, when I say platform agnostic, we're talking about fairings that are kind of on the, the scale of Falcon 9 or, you know, a, a an Atlas V or a neutron, you know, that that size. We don't need to go to Starship to get uh, Gravity Ring, P-Star, Pioneer Station launched. Uh, let's see here. Um, John Mark's asking, what will be the simulated gravity value of Pioneer? So the, the, the gravity factor, the simulated artificial gravity is based on your rotational speed um, and your radius. And so, for tourists, uh, a, a safe, a safe uh, rotational velocity is about 1.5 revolutions per minute. That um, the studies that have been done over the last several decades have shown that you can function in that with relatively little adaptation. Um, at Pioneer uh, Station scale, that doesn't provide a whole lot of gravity. It'll be enough to to keep your liquids in your cup. And you can use, you know, traditional uh, toiletry facilities, um, but you're not going to be able to like walk around normally. Um, it, it's going to be a, a low, low level. For, but like I was saying, for Pioneer, we're also looking at that being a research platform as well. And so for, we're going to have crew that are trained for higher uh, revolutions per minute RPMs. And uh, you know, some studies are saying two RPM is comfortable. It doesn't need a lot of adaptation. Uh, and with adaptation, people can function up to six RPM. So that's something we're going we're going to you know do some studies and figure out. 
So in the early days, conservatively, we're going to be at very low gravity levels. Um, for train crew, we'll be at lunar, and probably we could even try going up to Mars level gravity. Um, and and we'll we'll start to do those studies and find out you know what what is a as a reasonable level. When we move out to Voyager station, the goal there is to have lunar level gravity without adaptation requirements. So a tourist can go up there, no training, and be able to function normally without you know negative Coriolis effects and inner ear dizziness and that sort of thing. Uh, Marco says, do you plan for the Pioneer Station to generate any income, or will it just be a capability demo? Uh, absolutely, it's going to generate income. Uh, all the platforms that we launch need to be profitable. We're, we're a for-profit business, and you know, spending hundreds of millions of dollars to launch a station just as a demo isn't something that uh, is sustainable. So, so Pioneer Station will be profitable from day one, and the profits from Pioneer Station will then feed into the Voyager station development and other station development and, and fabrication. So, um, you know, Pioneer is the low entry to market point that allows us to then to build larger stations. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we're, we're almost at time, so we're going to try to get through these quickly here. Um, let's see. Athena's asking, what is Orbital Assembly doing to generate income more immediately so they don't go bankrupt before they're able to get the space station built? Um, yeah, we do not want to go bankrupt. <laughs> that, is, that is always an ongoing concern for a startup. So the, the net capital raises that we're doing right now, the equity financing that uh, we're bringing in is giving us the, the ability to engineer and design um, and, and make uh, you know, the, the hires we need to, to get fabrication started on Pioneer Station. Our timelines for Pioneer Station having it operational are actually about two years from the time we have the funding for it. So that's that's kind of our, our roadmap. And then you know once we have Pioneer Station operational, then then we'll be we'll be uh, you know generating revenue from it. In the in the short term, uh, Pioneer Station you know securing leases, uh, getting customer contracts in place. Th those are some of the things we're doing. That way, day one, Pioneer Station is profitable. So that, that's something we're working on right now. Um, our, our CEO and our our marketing team are actively pursuing all those contracts and, and getting customers lined up. Now, um, we can't really claim that as profit because that's for services that haven't been rendered yet. But the so the time frame we're looking at really is two years from the time of funding to get the station operational. So so that's the that's the runway we're looking for. You know, build the station, uh, keep operations for two years, and then and then income with the station. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Don's saying, I've seen some estimates for Starship as $7,500 per human to orbit. Uh, Voyager, $10 per kilogram. What are your thoughts? So if, if you look at the, I mean, the numbers that Elon Musk said last night at uh, $10 million a launch for Starship and 150 tons per orbit, assuming you use the full capacity of Starship, that puts you at 67 dollars per kilogram. If you have an 80 kilo person, that's like $5,360 if my, if my math's right. Um, then you build in that into that, you know, the fixed costs and the cost of operating the station and all that. Um, it, well, actually for Starship, you wouldn't be calculating our costs. But yeah, I mean, launch costs of $7,500 per person, possibly. Like I was talking about, you also have the life support systems and all the interiors that go into Starship as well. So that adds some cost to it. Um, and, and decreases your payload, uh, you wouldn't have the full 150 tons because a certain amount of that is for, for the, the interiors of the rocket. But, um, you know, it, it is yet to be seen. I think $7,500 a person is something that we're going to get to. Uh, if that's launch one or launch 20 of Starship, you know, that, that's to be seen. Okay, we're going to take a couple of questions from um, the audience here. We're going a little bit over, but first uh, we'll go to Aiden. And then uh, we'll go to to Matthew. So so go ahead, Aiden. Oh, I was going to ask, uh, how will gravity ring protect protect itself from geomagnetic storms and other deep space ha hazards? Yeah, that's a great question, especially with you know in the news recently, uh, SpaceX lost forty of their their little Starlink satellites. So that that you know is is a concern. Um, it's shielding, I and mean, it's really basically what it comes down to: uh, shielding and uh, redundancy. So you have multiple computers that are 
doing cross checks to make sure they get this, the right answers and you shield those sensitive electronics. Um, you know, on ISS right now, people are using iPads and iPhones and laptops that are just, you know, off the shelf stuff because they're within that, uh, that shielded environment. Um, I think the Starlink satellites in particular, just because of their size and their cost, they're just not uh, robustly shielded. So, so we, we would have, um, you know, more robust shielding and more, uh, duplication of systems to protect against that. Uh, okay, Matthew, uh, go ahead. First of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much for doing these. Uh, there's not a lot of other projects that will let us invest, let alone tell us what's going on. So I really appreciate these. Um, what do you think, what's the thing that keeps you up at night? What's the biggest hurdle to getting to an actual station in orbit, profitable, or at least attempting to be profitable? And how can those of us that want to see it succeed help other than buying stock and, and sharing the net capital raise? What else? Is there anything else that can be done? Yeah, I really appreciate that, Matthew. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here. Uh, today, we've got a really great turnout, which, which uh, you know, glad to have everybody here. And I enjoy doing these. Uh, like I've said so many times, we're so appreciative of the people who trusted us, you know, to the level that they're willing to invest. And with that comes a great deal of responsibility. And so we're trying to be as open and, and have as much of a dialogue as possible. There's, you know, there's other companies that are right on their heels wanting to build commercial space stations. So I can't just be completely frank with all the technical stuff we're doing just from a competitive standpoint. But um, yeah, again, having this dialogue, I, I feel is really important and, and, and we're happy to keep doing it. Uh, to the other parts, uh, things that keep me up at night. So I try not to worry about things that are outside of my control. <laughs> There's a lot of things in space that are just not in my control. So the things that I worry about the most, um, or the things I just say that we're, we're putting our energy right now, um, definitely the capitalization. We have, I think, uh, some of the strongest uh, technical uh, designs and just a, a really stellar engineering team. Um, and making that a reality requires funding. So right now, the thing that we're really working on, uh, on the funding side, that's two parts. One's investment, but the other part is customers. And so th those are the things we're really working on right now. I, I wouldn't say that it necessarily keeps me up at night, but it definitely um, is where my focus is at. And actually, you know, the things that wake me up at night are engineering ideas. <laughs> the other, actually, just like two nights ago, um, I woke up and I had this idea of how we could do this, 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 uh, you know, this the bearing and this, 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 this component. And so, uh, you know, the morning I got up and I sketched it out and, and passed it over to Tom. And Tom and I had have a string of emails going back and forth. Uh, Tom Spilker as well. You know, uh, both of us uh, have have engineering design ideas that are always coming, but. Um, then the last part of your question, Matthew, about what you can do, um, you know, I, I think one of the one of the things that we are going to struggle with until we actually have something operational in orbit is just um, a lot of skepticism, and and it's and it's justifiable. There's been a lot of space startups that have come and gone. There's a lot of money actually moving into space startups right now, and there's only a certain percentage of us that are actually going to succeed and, and and see something. Uh, you know, be realized. Um, not everybody who is following us is on these calls or watching watching the videos or reading everything that we have on our website or you know, pouring through all the documents. Um, and there's there's a lot of mis misinformation and and assumptions that people make. So I, th I think you know, just helping to to be an advocate and um, just champion for the cause uh, goes a long way. If nothing nothing else, just for our morale, uh, you know, on the team, it's. It's rough. I think Elon Musk recently asked on Twitter, he's like, you know, why is the press all so negative? Um, we don't have it as bad as, as Musk's projects. He, he, gets, he gets the brunt of, of media hate. Uh, we actually, in the media, actually have a pretty good, uh, uh, you know, uh, reputation, I guess. The articles that come out about us are, are overwhelmingly positive. But uh, just helping to, to spread that message and, and, and share the excitement of what we're doing, I, I think that's a big help. Um, okay, so we're we're out of we're out of time here, but I want to just uh, give everybody a chance here. There's 20 messages I haven't gotten to. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, one, Chuck's asking about limits and penalties if you invest more than a, a particular limit. Uh, uh, Net Capital does a pretty good job of trying to validate and make sure that you're not investing past your limit. But um, yeah, definitely consulting with your own own team is uh, is is always advisable. Um, Benny's asking, how many shareholders do we have? I don't know what the current count is. I think in the first round we had around 11, 1200, and I think we're about 14, 15 in the current round. I haven't done the math to see what the overlap is between those two. Um, also, will we allow aliens on our space hotel? Um, it depends on how you define aliens. Uh, you know, technically anybody who's not from your place of origin is an alien. So uh, there's probably some people to be considered aliens from Earth. Um, yeah, Tim, Tom Spoker is saying, yeah, unknowingly, Tim and I both lost sleep thinking about the spin bearing design the same night. Yeah, um, you know, the there's there's things that keep us up uh, from a technical standpoint. Not not that we're worried we can't solve it, but just we have we have ideas. Um, and then Benny says uh, he's sharing our video. Uh, th thanks so much for sharing those videos. OK, well, that that brings us to the end of this call. And I'm actually late for another meeting. But um, again, we haven't had one of these in a while. So I wanted to try to give everybody a chance. Um, if, if you haven't invested yet, uh, go to the Net Capital site and you know consider investing. And uh, um, if you haven't, if you aren't able to invest, share it with some friends. And if you don't feel comfortable investing, you know no pressure. Uh, obviously, you know do do what's best for your own individual risk tolerance and situation. But uh, we are so so grateful to everybody who's who's been a supporter uh, for the last number of years and and look forward to. To seeing more of you, we we had a great investor event last year with the D Star demo, and I'm looking forward to doing another one, um, hopefully this year. You know, we'll see what we can put together. But it's uh, it's great to meet you guys in person and hear your ideas. And um, I just want one other thought. We get a lot of emails from from you guys, and uh, you know, just apologies again and again for not being able to respond to those quicker. Uh, we don't have a very large team that's monitoring those emails. I think there's. There's three of us that are working through trying to get through those emails as, as quickly as we can. And, and, and for my part, that's after I deal with all the business emails, I, I try to go over there and help out. Um, so if you see emails and responses coming out like late at night or on the weekends, that's usually me. And then our, the emails that are going out during the day are our are, are normal team. But um, uh, if you have a question or a suggestion or an idea, you know, feel free to reach out to us and we'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. Okay, well with that, uh, thanks everybody. And we'll see you at the next call. Thank you.